Everybody, Kathleen Jasper here, and we are doing the Praxis Early Childhood Elementary Education 5025. Just have to make sure I'm live in all my places, and it looks like I am, so this is good. Come on into the webinar. We are doing early childhood today. Anybody taking the early childhood exam will benefit from this particular webinar. So no matter where you are, you can always um, come to our resources and it will help you to pass your, your exam. So today we are talking about the Praxis Early Childhood that is pre-K through third grade. My name is Kathleen Jasper and I am thrilled to be here with you. For the last 10 years, I've been helping teachers and prospective leaders pass their certification exams. I just ran to my computer because I thought I had more time than I did. So I'm a little bit disheveled, but it's all good. We will get started here in just a second. Good morning, Ruth. Good morning, Susie. Good morning, Juana. Uh, we got people from New Jersey. Let me know in the chat where you're from. Now in the chat, lots of Jersey. We always have a lot of Jersey teachers. Welcome, guys. South Carolina, awesome. Um, I have a colleague in the chat and she will help you with the offer code that we are giving you guys today for our... Praxis Early Childhood Resources. And if you have any questions, I may not be able to answer all your questions because I'll be doing my presentation. I won't see the questions, but her name is Yana and she is in the chat and she is wonderful. And so um, just want to make sure that you guys know that. Now, if you're on Facebook or anywhere else on social media, um, you can see us there live. And if you're interested in getting the resources that come with this webinar, there's a link in the description and you can use the form in that link, once you click the link, it'll take you to a thank you page. After you fill out the form, you'll get the free um, study guide, that's what it's called, and the webinar replay link, so you can watch it later on demand. All of you who are actually in the webinar, and there's about 50 of you right now live, we had over 1,600 people sign up for this webinar, so lots of people need help on this test. But those of you who are live today, in about 30 minutes after the webinar is over, you will receive a, an email from us with all everything we talked about, the replay links, you can watch on demand, you can watch it again, and any resources I talk about, and also the free study guide and some coupon codes. So just be on the lookout for that. So if your internet goes out, if my internet goes out, if something happens and you can't stay for the whole webinar, it's totally fine. Just check your email in like an hour after we're done and you'll get everything. So you can watch it again, no problem. All right, we got Louisiana, South Carolina, Georgia, Jersey, Maryland, Rhode Island. Awesome guys, I'm so glad you're here. All right, so we are talking about the Praxis Early Childhood. This is a very popular program. We've been prepping for this exam for quite some time, and this is typically um, the test that teachers take who want to teach pre-K through third grade. So it, there's a little bit of elementary ed in there, but there's also some early childhood stuff that's a little bit different than the elementary education exam. So those of you who are teaching the, the little ones, so I admire you all. So that's the group of kids that scares me the most. I was a high school teacher and a high school administrator. I'd rather teach the big kids than the little kids. The little kids scare me, but um, the big kids don't scare me as much as the little kids do. All right, so let's go through a few things before we get started. First, I wanna show you where you can get our resources, both free and paid. So we do have a study guide. We have a physical study guide one that you can touch on Amazon, and we have a digital study guide you can order on our website. So let me just show you where to get these resources, because if you are interested, you'll know where to get those. So on my website, you just go to KathleenJasper.com, and under our programs, you just click, where are you? Uh, early childhood education. And when you do, you will see these two here. Now, I know some people need 5024. We're working on it. I hope to have a 5024 book and online course soon, but we don't have that yet. Um, we are working on it. But these are the two things we offer. Now, the study guide is digital. When you order it from us, it's a digital study guide. Don't print it. That's too much ink and everything. Just go here to Amazon. Just click that button and it'll take you here and you can get the physical book here on Amazon. It'll be delivered in two days. I don't recommend buying the digital and printing it. Now we are offering um, a discount today for everybody attending the webinar. It's in the chat. My colleague will put that discount code in the chat. 
And you can use that on our website. Unfortunately, you can't use it on Amazon because Amazon is the publisher and they don't let me put discounts on there. Um, I have to change the price and go through this whole thing. And it's just, it's really problematic. So if you want the physical book on Amazon, it's going to be full price. But if you want to do the digital, you can do that here on my website and you're going to get a 20% off coupon. So totally worth it. Now, the other thing we have are the online courses. Now, people find a lot of value in this online course. In the online course are hours of videos, extra practice, tons of visual elements, and it comes with the digital study guide. So when you buy the online course, you get everything. You'll be taken to our learning management system. That's like another little website that we have that houses all of our online courses. And you will get the digital study guide to download and save to your computer. So you get the book and then you have all of the modules and everything else. And let me just see if I can pull that up for you, just so you can have a look and see. Give me one second. Um, but the online courses, people really like the online courses. So let me just, before I share my screen, okay, here we go. Let me go ahead and real quick. Okay, we'll go to preview and share this tab. So this is the online course here. And you can see we've got the blueprints and specs. I'm gonna walk you through that today. Then we have the study guide. This is the full digital study guide. So you download it and you get everything that's in the book. And then we have all of these modules here for the reading, writing, the literacy section. There's some drag and drop you know, things here. Um, there's different elements. We've got flashcards and things like that. Um, and then of course there's video and, you know, there's also a two hour webinar I did a long time ago and people love this two hour webinar right here. It's from back in the day. Um, and people love this. So I left it in there. You can use it as an audio course or whatever. So this is really helpful for people. And remember, when you buy the online course, you get everything. So you don't have to buy both and wait for the offer code. You'll get 20% off. Okay. Now I just wanted to show you that. Uh, let's see here. Stop sharing. Um, just wanted to show you that as we move forward, because some of you want more. Now, some people use our free stuff. Like today, you'll use this with a, with the free study guide. The free study guide is an abbreviated version of this. It's just a little bit with some practice test questions. But some people use that and they pass. We have tons of people who just use our free stuff and they they are winning. So whatever you decide. Um, whatever you decide. Now, somebody's asking, what's the difference between the 5025 and the 5024? Okay, I'm only talking about the 5025 today. I won't be covering the 5024. They're just different praxis exams for early childhood. Here's the deal. Every state is different. And so ETS, which is the company that makes the praxis exams, they make all different tests depending on what states want. So some states want you to be schooled in literacy, math, social studies, science, and like the arts, fine arts. They want you to take this. Other states want you to be proficient in early childhood development. The, 502, uh, the 5024 is early childhood development. It's very heavy on the developmental skills of student students. This is more content. This is more like, do you know your elementary science? Do you know your social studies? Okay. That's the difference. Okay. Um, so good question, Marie. Roxanne, your online course is fantastic. Oh, I'm so glad you love it. Yeah, I love doing the online courses. The book is excellent, Ruth. Thank you so much. All right, so we've got Yana in there and um, she is answering any questions. Um, you can go ahead and uh, if you're having trouble seeing me, just log out and log back in. Just shut down your browser and try it again. And usually that works. Okay. All right. Justine is asking any information on the foundations of reading tests. Okay. I have a whole teaching reading program. Most people use our Praxis teaching reading for that exam. They're very similar tests. They cover the exact same things, just in a different order. And so if you want that, you just go to our website for teaching reading. And I just released a new audio course for that, that people really like. So at the end of this, I'm going to show you some new resources that we have. Okay. All right. Uh, how long does the off 20% offer code good for? It's good for whenever I never, I should make them expire, but I don't. So you can just use it whenever. Um, I just appreciate you uh, being here today, Shay. So thank you so much. Okay. If we have the book, do we get access to the digital version? Okay. Here's the thing. If you bought the book on Amazon, and you decide today, hey, I want the online course, you can send us an email with a screenshot of your purchase. Don't just take a picture of the book. 
Some people just take a picture of the book and they're like, see, I have it. We need the purchase that you purchased it from Amazon. Make sure your name is visible and we will send you an offer code that takes the price of the book off the course because you, the course comes with the book. So we like to say, if you change your mind and you want the course, we'll send you an offer code and you can use that. And we're here today. Um, if you reach us after hours, we'll get to you tomorrow or later on tonight when I, when my customer service people come on. Um, so just be patient there. We'll be here today for a little while, but, um, and we'll send you an offer code. You apply that and it'll take the price of the book off. Okay. So a lot of you, a lot of people like to switch. They're like, Oh, I got the book, but now I want the online course. So that's good. Okay. All right. We got like 110 people in the room. Awesome. We got a bunch of people on Facebook too. So this is great. Uh, can this book 5025 be used in New Jersey? Yes, Marie. New Jersey uses the 5025 to certify their um, early childhood teachers. But here's the thing, guys, you have to figure out what test you're taking. So you need to go to your de state department of education website. You can also Google, write this down. Uh, Praxis test by state or Praxis state requirements. It'll take you to the Praxis website. You click your state, you click your grade level, you would be early childhood or elementary ed or whatever you're trying to get certified in, and it will list your exact test there. Don't just wing it and say, oh, I think I have to take this test. You don't want to spend money. You don't want to study for a test you're not required to take. Every state is different. So make sure you're on the lookout for that. Um, what if you bought the digital version and want the online course? No problem. We'll look you up, Sharon, and we'll see that you bought the digital version and we'll send you an offer code. Just send us an email at info at KathleenJasper.com and we'll make that happen for you. No problem. I bought, I bought the book on Amazon, so I'm ready. Awesome. Elsa, I'm ready too. Let's get into it. All right. So today we're talking early childhood and it's not an easy test. People think, oh, um, you know, it's, it's early childhood. It's supposed to be so easy. It's pre preschool. Well, it's been a long time since you've thought about mixtures, right? Homogeneous versus heterogeneous mixtures. It's been a long time since you thought about rocks. It's been a long time since you've done some of this math. And some of the math is hard because they do it a common core way. And it's different than when I was, um, growing up. So, you know, it's not easy. And so don't listen to people when they say, oh, it's a elementary test. Oh, it's a, it's an early childhood test. You should be able to pass it. These exams are really hard and they have a really low first time pass rate. So if you have to take it again, it's all good. What would you say to your students? Um, you can do it. Keep trying and keep fixing up those skills. Now, the other thing I will tell you, if you're just taking practice tests over and over again, you're probably not going to be successful because you're just kind of trying to guess on questions. And I don't know what questions you're gonna get on the exam. We have really good questions in here, but they're not on the test. I don't know what test you're gonna get. So what you wanna do is really read the book, definitely do the practice test, but get to know that important information, especially for literacy and math. In my opinion, those are the two hardest because they have more scenario-based questions because they want you to be a literacy teacher and a math teacher. So you're gonna have teaching scenarios. I'm gonna show you how to navigate those, okay? So, and then after the webinar's over, I'm gonna bring you to some free resources and some additional videos and things that's that are gonna, going to help you with this, okay? All right, so let me get started. Let me share my screen here. All right. So we are talking early childhood. This is the 5025. And this particular exam has five major sections. It's delivered in all one test. So it's not done up like subtests like the 5001 is. Like the 5001, you have four big subtests and they're all scored separately. This test, they're all scored together. Okay. Now, Language arts and literacy and math are the biggest pieces of this test. You can see over here, it's over half of the test are those two subjects. Well, why? Because literacy is probably the most important, although math teachers might uh, disagree with me, but literacy is the most important content area you could be teaching as an early childhood teacher, right? Because um, you, in order to do anything, including math, you have to be able to read and understand symbols and letters and all of that. So it's very important. And then of course, math is the foundation as well. So you've got 36 questions for language and literacy and 30 questions for math. This is 120 questions. So over uh, 60, 66 questions. 
are language arts and literacy and math. And so really pay attention to those chapters in the book. Not to say that the social studies, science and health and physical education and performing arts aren't important, but the bulk of the test is coming from these first two subjects. Okay. Now you have two hours to complete this and it's a straight up selected response uh, test, meaning you will not have to write anything. There is no constructed response. So you don't have to worry about writing an essay. So that's good. But sometimes, you know, just selected response can be difficult. Remember, selected response is like multiple choice, except some questions will say, choose all that apply or choose three. That's why they call it selected response, because some of them, you have to choose more than one right answer, all right? Then the third part is social studies, the fourth is science, and the fifth is your health, physical education, creative, and performing arts. So they kind of lump PE and performing arts together. Think of um, the fifth uh, content area here as your specials. Um, numbers one through four are your core academics, and number five are your specials, okay? Um, if you're already teaching early childhood or you're already in elementary teaching, you know what the specials are. You take your kids to the art room, you take your kids to the PE room, and that's what um, the, the fifth bullet here is, okay? Now, for this exam, a passing score is a 156 for most states. That's only a little bit over 50% correct. So you don't need 100 on this test. And I find it to be comforting when somebody says that to me. I don't need 100 on the exam. I need a low D in order to be in the safe zone here. Now, it's very difficult for me to predict exactly how many questions you need to pass. People say that, how many do I need to get right? How many do I need to get right? And I would say to you the same thing you would say to your students. I can't give you that exact answer, but you want to be in the range. I always like to tell people, be at a 75%. That is way above what you need, but... Um, it's the safe zone. You know, you don't know how it's all going to play out on test day. So I really like to tell people before you go in and take the test, make sure you can get to a 75% on the practice test. That's my philosophy. However, you really need a low D. I mean, this is technically, you know, if they're all weighted the same, uh, this could even be an F because it's only 56% correct. So I have a blog and some videos on my YouTube channel on how to calculate your Praxis Core score. You basically take how many you got right, your raw score, drop the percentage and put a one in front of it. So um, figure out what your raw score is in terms of a per percentage. So if it's 120 questions and you got 80 correct, so 80 out of 120 let me get my calculator here. I don't like doing math live. So you do 80 divided by 120, and that's a 66666%. So it's a 0.67. Drop this decimal, and that would be a 167. Okay. So if you're looking for a 156, it's around 56%. So um, that's a little, let's see, uh, 120. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on, clear. Uh, let's do, no, not 60. Let's do 75 divided by 120. Yeah, I mean, that's the safe zone. You would need to get about 75, 75 questions right out of 120. It's a little more than 50% correct. So you don't need an A, you need a high D or a low D or kind of an F. So I don't like to give exacts because I don't know how your questions are going to be weighted. Some are worth more than others. Remember, I told you that some of them are choose all that apply. Those are worth more than just the easy select one answer. Um, the big scenario questions are worth more. And it's a scale score rather than a raw score because there are different forms of the test. Not everybody takes the same form of the test. This is a standardized state assessment. It's very um, protected. So they're going to shuffle the items. They're going to use different items. That's why you don't know which ones you're going to get. So just be on the lookout for that. Try not to worry too much about getting your exact right score. Just study. If you need to take it again, it's all good. All right, let's talk about the first content category, language and literacy. All right, language and literacy, you're going to see things like this. So it's all it's going to be about phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, reading, spelling, phonics, all of that. So I always like to start with the answer choices first. If you've seen my videos, you know that that's how I do things. It tells me what I'm expected to do. I like to work backwards. My little thing here. Okay. I want to hide that. That's annoying me. Okay. So 
I see character development, plot sequence, point of view, and setting. And I can see that uh, I'm going to have to figure out what sort of skills we're doing here. Can't eliminate anything from my answer choices, but it sets me up to know that I'm going to have to figure out what the students are doing. All right, let's read the question. A teacher reads the story, The Giving Tree, to first grade students. This is my favorite book in the whole world. She has students use a graphic organizer where they match pictures from the story to the beginning, middle, and end. The students then share their graphic organizers with a partner. Which of the following concepts of literary structure is the class working on? Well, beginning, middle, and end, this is plot sequence. Now, you may say, oh, it's too easy. Um, if it's that easy, it can't be the answer. It is. If it's obvious, it's the answer. Don't fall into the trap of like, oh, that's way too, that's way too on the nose. That's, that can't be it. It is. You are a beginning teacher. They are not expecting you to have a master's degree in early childhood education, you're just starting out. They want you to be able to see, okay, this right here is a sequence. They're using a graphic organizer to do a sequence. Grab the answer that is correct. Now, some will not be this easy. Some will be a lot harder, but grab that low hanging fruit. Grab that those easy questions because you wanna get all of the easy questions you can right. Uh, before you start getting into the hard questions. So that's just test taking 101. Do the easy ones, make sure you answer them. And if it's obvious, it's the answer. Go ahead and choose it. All right, let's have a look at this. So again, only one word answers here. Can't really do, you know, the good words, bad words strategy I talk about. But um, we can see directionality, sequencing, leveling, and pictures. These are also skills that we'll be teaching students. So let's have a look here. A kindergarten teacher displays an oversized book in the front of the class. As the teacher reads the lines in the book, she sweeps her hand from left to right. And we do this in the early grades, right? You have a big book, you're showing students how to use a book. And this is indicating how students read English. The teacher is working on what type of concept? Directionality. We have the words left to right, which indicate direction. Now, sequencing is what we just did. First part of the story, second part of the story, third part of the story. Leveling is uh, when we use different leveled books. So if I'm leveling, I'm, I've got some students who are reading on grade level. So I'm giving them on grade level books. I have some students that are below grade level, really below. So I have to help them and give them a little bit easier books to practice with so they can get better and get to that on level, right? And then I may have students who are way past uh, you know, first grade or, or kindergarten, they might be reading chapter books. Some kids in kindergarten are already reading chapter books. And so you want to level up for them. That's leveling. Remember in these early grades, you've got uh, students who have such a range of abilities. You got kids who can't even write their first name and you have other kids who are reading chapter books, right? So this, this is why uh, kindergarten and, and pre-K teachers are, you know, I admire them so much because you really have to differentiate in these classrooms. But this is going to be directionality from left to right. All right, let's have a look at this. So I can see here, onset and rhyme, phonemic awareness, cueing systems and syllables, other reading skills we're going to be looking at. And if I look at the picture continuing to work backwards, I can see that these are broken up by onset and rhyme. All right. So without even reading this whole thing here, let me just talk to you about the way these words are broken up. So this word here, ter, ac, that's broken up by onset and rhyme. The ter, the, the consonant or the consonant cluster is the onset and the ac is the rhyme, I R I M E. And this is a phonological awareness technique. It is not a phonemic awareness. We have to be careful. Um, I go over this a lot in the online course and also on my videos in YouTube. Phonological awareness and phonemic awareness are sounds only in words. And this is where early childhood comes in because as students start to read, we're teaching them sounds and words. Um, and they're doing this without actually seeing the word. These are, you can see these words here, but typically phonemic awareness and phonological awareness are just done by listening and speaking. And if I said, all right, let's break up the word track by onset and rhyme, and the kids would go ter ack, they know that the onset is the beginning consonant or consonant cluster, and the rhyme is the vowel and then the consonants that 
um, follow the vowel here. Now, if it were phonemic awareness, it would be individual sounds. T, er, a, k, or the K sound, I should say here, right? That's phonemic awareness, much more nuanced. You have to know um, the individual sounds. Phonemic awareness is bigger chunks of the words. Now, it's definitely not syllables. I can cross that off because these are all one syllable words. So we're not doing syllables. Cueing systems come, comes later with vocabulary and comprehension and a little bit of fluency. But cueing systems typically are when we can't figure out a word in a sentence and we use our cueing system, semantic, syntactic, graphophonic, uh, cues to figure that out. That's not what's happening here. And so this would be a onset and rhyme. Let's just have a look at the question to make sure students are using the chart below for a classroom activity. They are matching different parts of the words to make a whole word. What are the students working on? They're working on onset and rhyme. So four is a, all right, let's have a look at nine. Oh, I get to talk about my cueing systems here. I can see semantic, syntactic, graphophonic, and pragmatic. All right, so I uh, can't do much without reading here. A student is reading through a piece of text. When he gets to a difficult word, he uses the pictures in other words to determine the unknown word's meaning. The student is using which cueing system? All right, let's go through these. You will see these on the exam. Semantic. The M in semantic, I like to match with meaning. So if you're using pictures or the teacher asks, does that make sense? That is the semantic cueing system. That is A. Syntactic or syntax is the grammar. So for example, if you're reading and you're stuck on a word and maybe it's got the ing or maybe you're trying to figure out the word and the rest of the sentence is in past tense, then you know that word is in past tense. That'll help you kind of pronounce it, structure, the word structure and things like that. That is syntactic. It's the syntax. Graphophonic is the letter, sa letter sound correspondence. This is the phonics. You're sounding it out. You're decoding it. And then pragmatic, that is like social cues. Typically in ESOL, we talk about pragmatics. Um, but, you know, if you're reading, you can kind of figure out, you know, as you read, if the student, if the character is talking to a teacher or talking to a friend, you can kind of use your social cues to figure out things. But this is typically done in ESOL education, um, but it is a cueing system. But in this case, we're looking at meaning. And so we're talking about the semantic cueing system. Match that M with meaning. Okay. All right. And number 10. Okay. This is one where I can use my work backwards strategy and eliminate bad words and zero in on good words. All right. So I have A, lower the standards right away. Eh. We never lower the standards. We scaffold, we support, we differentiate, we help to push students up, 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 but we never lower the standard because every student is held to these standards at the end of the year. So if we lower the standard, we're not doing the student any favors. So A is always out. B, differentiate instruction and accommodate learners in meeting their goals. Has all the good words. First of all, if you see the word differentiate instruction or words like it, for example, um, meeting uh, meeting the students' needs or helping struggling students by, you know, tailoring instruction, targeting interventions. That's all differentiated instruction, 100% the correct answer on this exam. C, pair students with more advanced students for peer tutoring. Typically, no. Now, here's the thing. Pairing students is not a bad thing, but if this is attached to a student who is struggling, peer tutoring is not your answer. Now, cooperative learning is great. Buddy systems are great. But if it's attached to a student who is struggling with reading, writing, spelling, anything like that, you can't rely on their peer to fix the situation. We're the teacher. We have to do the differentiation. We have to do the targeted um, uh, instruction. So pairing kids up is okay. It's not the best. Beware. If it's attached to struggling students, it's not the correct answer. D, use incentives to motivate students to meet their goals. Now, if you're a new teacher, you might say, well, that's good. Use incentives to motivate students. Of course, I use lollipops and gummy bears and extra time on the playground and homework passes. I did too as a teacher. But typically, incentives and extrinsic rewards are not the correct answer on this exam. Now, on the special ed exam, 
There are some extrinsic rewards we use to condition students who have behavioral uh, exceptionalities. But on this test, we want students to read for the love of reading. <laughs> and that's hard to do these days. But we want to use intrinsic rewards, not extrinsic rewards. So D would be out, all right? And A is definitely out. Let's read the question. Which of the following would be most effective? That's the key, most effective approach to help students with varying needs and literacy. If you see the term varying needs, it's got to be differentiated instruction because you're meeting each student's needs. Okay. Now you may say, well, some of these, all of these look good or B, C, and D all look good, right? I mean, if you look at C, an advanced student would get something out of tutoring a lower level student, right? Because the advanced student then has to use his or her skills to tutor. So it's a challenge and you can talk yourself out of the correct answer all day long. Go with the good words. Don't overanalyze so much that you talk yourself out of the correct answer. I see people do this a lot. You have the word motivate here, but it's attached to extrinsic rewards. So motivates a great word. It's a good word on this test, but if it's attached to extrinsic rewards, it's, it's not. Okay. All right. Let's go to math. So math, I mean, it's not easy because there are some new concepts in math. I mean, they're not new now, but they're new for me. Cause when I grew up, it was like many of you, the same thing we had, we kind of did math the old school way, but you're going to see a lot of questions where we're talking about skills. You will have to do math, but they're also going to break down the student's skills here. So right away, I look at the picture and I can see I have transitivity pattern, subitizing and decomposition. Can't do much there. Let me see what's going on with the question. A teacher is using dice to help students recognize numbers. She rolls one die and the students immediately say three. What skill are the students and teacher working on? All right, when students can just look at a dots, a, a, a group of dots, like if they can see that this is five, or they see a cluster of blocks on the table and they go, oh, there's three blocks there really quickly. That is subitizing. And it's a skill that just, that is important because they have to start to kind of visualize what does two look like? What does three look like? Now, obviously when the numbers get really big, 25, 30, we can't look at well, some people can, but I can't uh, look at like 30 items on a table and go, oh, that's 33. You know, I have to count them, either do 5, 10, 15, 20, chunk them out or 2, 4, 6, 8. But when they're smaller numbers like this, you know, this is called subitizing. And again, this is helpful because then they can chunk things out. Like I just said, 5, 10, 15, 20, they can quickly identify things. So it's just getting them to understand numbers. Now let's talk about these other skills so you know the difference. Transitivity is when you transfer the info, I, I, this is how I explain it. You transfer the information from one thing to another. So if A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then A is also greater than C, correct? Because A is greater than B and B is greater than C. My husband just told me about it in terms of football. If we live in Florida, so we watch college football in Florida. So if the Seminoles beat University of Miami and the University of Miami has beaten the Gators, then the Seminoles should be able to beat the Gators, although it is a little bit different than math. But it's the same thing. You're transferring um, logic. So in this case, we'll use more concrete numbers when we're talking about math and, uh, you know, Florida State football, which is where we went to college. But if A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then A is also greater than C. All right. Now, patterns is important in the early grades, too, because they need to see different patterns, whether it's the shapes of patterns, the numbers, how things are added together. There's all different ways in which we use patterns. This helps with logic. This helps with understanding numbers. That's not what's happening here. And then decomposition is when you take a number like 360 and you go 300 and 60 and zero in the ones. You're decomposing it based on place value. All right. But the best answer here is subitizing. All right. Let's have a look at number three. These are all coming from your study guide. All right. A teacher is helping students. work. Oh, let me look at the, the answer choices first. Sorry. Defining area, drawing shapes, recognizing shape attributes, and identifying patterns. 
All right. So we have a teacher is helping students work towards the objective of classifying, look for the keywords and categorizing geometric shapes. Which prerequisite skill must students master before they can meet this new objective? All right. So look, let's think about Bloom's taxonomy. Whenever you get these kind of skill levels, think of Bloom's taxonomy okay, here. I'm going to draw a bad Bloom's. At the bottom, we have things like identify, recognize, understand, recall. Now, these are important skills because they lead to the higher level skills. You go to the second one and we're in compare and contrast and categorize. And then the, the upper levels here are the critical thinking. These are the high level skills. We want to be pushing students up, up, up that pyramid. Now, if we want them to get to this middle part, this categorize and uh, uh, what does it say? Classify. They're actually using two parts of their brain here. They're not just identifying. They're going, oh, this has four sides. This goes over here. Oh, this has four corners. This goes over here. Oh, this is round. That goes over here. Oh, this has six sides instead of four sides. That goes over here. You have to identify and then you have to put them in a category. Two processes in the brain. So what's the prerequisite skill here? We have to be able to recognize or identify. That's that first thing here, the bottom. So that's going to be C. Now it's not defining area. That's way too high. That's geometry. Drawing shapes, I mean, that could help, but really what we want is students to identify shape attributes. Does it have corners? If yes, then it goes over here. If no, then it goes over here, right? It might be a circle. It might be an ellipse, all right? How many sides does it have? And we further categorize that way. That's why recognizing shape attributes is important here. All right, and let's go to one more. All right, this is number eight in the study guide that you got with this webinar. Uh, we have what skill is a teacher working on? I'm continuing to work backwards, 345. I have the four underlined. Can't do much here. I know it's not subitizing. I can take that out, but A, multi-digit numbers, it's a multi-digit number. B, estimation, it could be asking me what the four changes to. Um, and D, place value, we're also talking place value here because you can see, let me erase this, the four is underlined. So I need to go into the question and look. A teacher is using the number below and ask, what is the value of the underline? All right, so this is place value. Now on the test, it may not say value, it may say uh, what, um, what number does it represent? Is it in the hundredths place, tens place, um, you know, that kind of thing. But that is place value. Now, if it said, well, it's definitely multi-digit numbers, but it's asking the value. So we would cross off A. Now, estimation, it would say, uh, you know, estimate what is 345 turn to, estimate based on the one spot, estimate based on the tens spot. If that's the case, if it was estimate based on the 10 spot, it would be 300. If it's estimate based on the one spot, it would be 350 because that four turns into a five and the five turns into a zero there. But in this case, it is place value because they're asking what is the value of the four? And what is the value of four? 40. Because if we were to break this down with decomposi decomposition, uh, we would say that this is 340 five. The four is in the tens place. That four means 40. Okay. All right. So let me go ahead and stop here and just stop sharing really quick and see if you guys have any questions. Okay. Um, let's go. Yep. I made a 140 the first time. Maryland passing is 154. Will you do a live video on the 5901? I have a ton of videos on the 5001, which is the same as the 5901. Check out my webinars on my, um, on my website. I have the 5001 that covers everything on the 5901. All right. Um, however, the score I needed was at at least a 197. I scored a 150 before I did not pass. How is this going to help me? Um, Annette, I don't believe you have to score a 197 on your test if you're taking the Praxis. That's not a score. That's really high. That's um, But you may be taking a different exam. So if you're taking a Pearson exam, you might have to score 197 and they score theirs differently. But it's still not a 97%. It's a high D, mid C there.
Um, what's the name of the book on Amazon? Okay. The name of the book is Praxis to Early Childhood. It's the green book, 5025. How do I know the passing score in New Jersey? Just look up Praxis scores by state. And there will be a table there. You can click your state and it'll tell you the scores. Okay. All right. Hi, if I get the course that is included in that, will I have mock tests? It's the practice tests that come with the book. So there's two full practice tests, I believe. So that's 240 practice tests just there. And there are practice test questions after each section in the book. Let me show you real quick. Let's just do this really quickly. Okay, let me show you what's in the book. So this is the book. Um, it's digital, but if you get a physical, obviously it's going to look like this. All right. And let me just go over here. Now in the digital book, it'll look like this, your PDF and the table of contents is hot. So you can click around the table of contents. Now after each section, and this is the paid study guide. So you didn't get this with the webinar. This is the bigger study guide. Um, in each section, you have 10 practice questions just for language and literacy. So let's go there. You can see here, I used one of these for the free study guide, but you can see that there are 10 questions with detailed answer explanations, okay? So that's for language and literacy, you have 10 questions. And then let me go back here. We have all of the information, tons of information for language and literacy. So anything you could want or need, I make sure I cover everything in the test specifications. It tells you everything you need to know about early literacy and things like that. Writing, early writing, all of that, okay? And then there are 10 questions after that. The same with math, let's go to math. Mathematics, we start off here and we go through all the prerequisites kids need all of these different shape attributes, things like that. Then we get into numbers and operations. There's actually a lot. I mean, some of this is really complicated in my opinion. It's not easy. Um, and then at the end of math, let me not make you dizzy. Let me go over here. There's also embedded questions for the math inside the book. And then at the end of the math section, there are 10 math questions just for that with detailed answer explanations. And then it goes into social studies and again, everything you could possibly need to know for this particular test in social studies, because I follow all the test specifications. We've got maps and timelines and, you know, uh, branches of government and things like that. And then at the end of social studies, we have a full or not a full 10 practice test questions. And the same goes for science. We work through all of this stuff here, you know, periodic table, all of that. And at the end of science, we have 10 questions. We go through life science, uh, energy pyramids, all these things that you probably haven't thought about in 50 years. Um, and then 10 science practice questions. And the same thing goes for um, art and PE. I go through health and PE and creative performing arts. And then I have 10 questions there. Then I have a quick reference guide, which is the good words list. So you should be thinking about these words on the test and bad words to avoid in your practice test questions uh, and, and on the test. And then I have some other things, um, especially for assessments. I have a lot of um, information on assessments. You're going to need this for the early grades. I have this in all my books. You'll notice this assessment table in pretty much all of my books. And I go through different reading comprehension activities, just things you need to know for those scenario questions. And then there is a full practice test here. So, uh, and that's got 120 questions. All right. And then, um, you know, some resources and stuff like that, but that is going to help you. So there's 10 questions after each um, after each section, and then there's a full practice test. Okay. So I hope that helps. Does the practice teaching and learning necessary for early childhood certification? Z, it depends. Um, is the PLT necessary in your state? It might be. I have the 5621 PLT and I'm doing a webinar for that in a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go into social science, social studies. Let's keep moving forward. What are we? 1044. We're right on track. Good. Let's keep going. All right. So we're in social studies. Here's what a social studies uh, question might look like. This is number six in your free study guide. I'm just doing a few questions here from the study guide that you have. So you'll want to do all of them, but I don't have time to do all of them today. So I'm just going through a few. Now with social studies on this exam, this is where the child development questions come in because anthropology, psychology, um, those types of 
content areas are in the social studies domain. And so along with the three branches of government and geography and econ and all that, um, our early childhood level, um, you will have questions about child development. So let's have a look at number six. Students in a first grade classroom are sharing their tools during an activity. They also clean up after the activity is order, a task they have practiced several times before. They understand that when they work together to learn and then clean up, they will have a positive experience in the classroom. This is an example of, this is self-efficacy, all right? Self-efficacy encompasses a lot of things, but one of it one of them is we work together. We're all, you know, I have to contribute to the class as well. I am important. She's important. These are things we have to teach the little ones because they're so egocentric that, and it's normal for them to be egocentric. They don't understand empathy yet. They don't, they don't get that. Um, and it's, they're, they're right on track for that. I have a chart in the book, Piaget's Four Stages of Cognitive Development. They are still at the early stages of cognitive development. They're very egocentric. And so we have to say, you know, like sharing is caring. Let's clean up, clean up. And we have to show them that it's important, right? So um, this is called self-efficacy. Now, self-pacing is a kind of a nonsense word here, but that would be, you know, uh, figuring out what our pace is and just moving through tasks and thing like, things like that. Self-esteem and self-actualization act actually come from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there are five levels. The bottom are our physiological needs, food, water, shelter. If a student doesn't, if, if a student is hungry, hasn't had anything to eat, if a student does not have a home, maybe, uh, is experiencing homelessness, those types of things. This bottom foundation is not being met. Therefore, the student's going to have a very hard time doing your uh, assignments. You know, if they're hungry, if they're tired, if they don't have a safe place to sleep, they're not they're not ready. They're not going to be motivated to do the work. Then we get up in here uh, where this is... Um, safety and security. So they may have a home, they may have enough to eat, but it may not be safe where they live. Or, you know, they just, they may live, you know, there's all kinds of things that shake our safety. Also health. They may have poor health. Again, they may have this bottom rung, that's good. And then they move to here and they may not, may not have that. Then this one is love and belonging. So love and belonging is like why we stand by our doors and say, good morning, thank you so much for coming today. I'm so glad you're here. You're such an important part of my class. This actually goes with self-efficacy and also um, uh, self-efficacy because we wanna feel like we're a part of something, we belong. Now, self-esteem is actually this tier right here. Self-esteem is when students have high self-esteem, especially at the younger levels, they will take chances. They'll try new things. They'll put themselves out there. If there's a difficult math problem, they'll try it. If they have low self-esteem, they won't do that. So that's why I want to make sure they they have that self-esteem run. And then up here at the very top that we are all trying to get to is self-actualization. I mean, even as adults, this can be difficult to get to, even with all the resources, all of the love and belonging and esteem and safety and food, water, shelter. Self-actualization is what does it all mean? Why am I here? What is my purpose? I mean, I think like we're all trying to get there. Um, and some days I'm there and some days I'm not, but that's the Maslow hierarchy of needs. And that's in the book. And I have this in the PLT as well. But the this number six is talking about self-efficacy. All right, let's have a look at another one. So we're talking about democracy. Let's have a look at the answer choices. Have students work in cooperative groups to vote on classroom procedures. Okay, a couple things I like about A without even reading the question. Cooperative groups is a good word depending on what we're talking about, but I like it. And then to vote on classroom procedures, Procedures are very important in the classroom, whether it's early childhood, kindergarten, first, second, whatever, all the way up to high school. Procedures are so important. And to vote on these procedures helps to give students autonomy and they're more likely to um, follow those expectations and procedures. Now, can you vote on every single expectation you have in the classroom? Probably not. And can you lead students to vote to the one that you want them to do? Yes. But voting on this and using a democratic uh, approach is really, really good. So I like A. B, have students work together to complete tasks. 
All right. That's good too. It's not as good as A, but I like it. C, show a video about how a bill is passed. No. Videos are great. We got to be careful in social studies. A lot of times we rely too much on video. We don't want to show a whole video, pieces of videos, okay, to support the overall learning, but show a video is usually not the right answer on this exam. Have a guest speaker present information about democracy. A lot of people like the guest speaker thing. Guess what though? A guest speaker is just a lecture. It's just a different person lecturing. They might pass around some artifacts and some rocks or whatever, but it's still a direct instruction lecture format. So not the most engaging. So I'm between A and B. Let's have a look at the question. Which of the following is the most effective activity to demonstrate democracy? Well, democracy means vote. And remember, even if it's obvious, it's the answer. So go with the obvious. All right, let's go to science. These are some concepts you may not have thought about in a while. This is number one in the science for the free study guide. All right, right away, this stands out to me. Curiosity and inquiry. This is what we want students to be in science. We want to promote curiosity and inquiry. We want them to ask questions. We want them to hypothesize. We want them to test. We want them to experiment. And we have to show them how to do this. And so if I'm talking science and I see curiosity or inquiry, it's probably the right answer. I'm circ circling it. Diligence and perseverance, great skills, science, curiosity, and inquiry win. Skepticism and cynicism, we don't want them to be cynical yet. They have lots of time in their life to be cynical. Do we want them to be skeptical in science? Yeah. That's why when we make an experiment or we do an experiment and it goes in our favor, we have to be skeptical. We have to say, hmm, let me test it five, six, seven hundred more times before I believe it. So skepticism is good. Cynicism, that's not good. We don't want them to be cynical. And D, interest and happiness. Well, do we want them to be interested and do we want them to be happy? Sure. But curiosity and inquiry is better. Number one, which of the following is most important? Most important in science? Curiosity and inquiry. Remember that for the test. You will most likely have a question on that. Number four. Which of the following has an open circulatory system? Okay, this is one of those, quote, easy questions that you may not know because you haven't thought about it since you yourself were in, uh, you know, first grade or second grade, okay? So let's go over it. First of all, let's just do a quick, um, a quick uh, strategy. Think like a test maker, okay? I always say that, think like a test maker. Cows and humans are both... Um, mammals. So if I was stuck here, I might, and because there's only one correct answer, I might cross those out right away because they have some similarities and I can only have one answer. A cow is a mammal and a human is a mammal. Um, and then we're left with fish and grasshopper. So I just increased my chances by 50, 50. So that's a little testing strategy, right? But let's talk about open circulatory system versus closed circulatory system. So in an open circulatory system, there are holes in the organism um, called spiracles, and the air just comes in, the oxygen just comes into the body, all right? With a closed circulatory system, the organism has to breathe the air in, and it's closed because it goes into an area lungs dedicated for that or gills. So a fish, a cow, and a human all have closed circulatory systems, meaning they use lungs or gills to process oxygen. A grasshopper has an open circulatory system because the oxygen just comes in the body through these tiny holes in the body. So that would be D. But even if you had forgotten that, um, you could at least get down to 50 50 and then grab what you could there and hopefully get it okay and they'll do that sometimes a lot of times they'll have like cow human um dolphin right so they may say dolphin um and then you would know c b and a are all mammals let's go with d because it's so different and you are only need one correct answer that's one way to do it i'm not saying it always works but that is a test strategy that will help you all right, let's have a look at the answer choices. These rocks are very pretty. I like this rock better than this rock. This rock feels smooth and this rock feels rough. I have rocks like this in my backyard. Okay, can't do much there. Let's have a look at the question. 
A teacher brings in different types of rocks for students to pass around and make observations. All right, right away, I guess pretty is an observation. I like this rock better than that rock, not really an observation. This is smooth and this is rough. That's a real observation. That's going, hmm, that's smooth. Hmm, that's rough. That's the inquiry we're looking for. That's, I wonder why that's smooth. That's the questioning we want. I wonder what makes this rock rough. Hmm. Those are the types of questions we want students to ask. So I'm already leaning towards C. Which of the following would be an example of an observation that would aid in classifying rocks? So here's a further um, uh, cue or clue. We classify rocks based on hardness and smooth versus rough is one of those attributes. So C looks great. D, you can't classify them based on your backyard. And whether you like it or not, that's not really a classification for rocks. And pretty, hate to break it to you, um, is not a, a way in which we classify things in science. So uh, C is the best answer there. All right, one more content category to go, health, PE, and creative arts. All right, this is number one in the free study guide. Here we go, A, B, C, and D. Read a play to students and analyze each character. Okay, I like the word analyze. Um, that's a high level skill. We always wanna be helping students towards that. If, remember I talked about blooms, we wanna be up here, we wanna move them up, up, up towards the blooms taxonomy at the top. So analyze is critical thinking, I like it. I'm gonna leave it. Right now it's in the running as my first place. B, allow students to dress up as their favorite character and act out a scene in the play. All right, remember, these are little kids. Play, play, play is important. And I argue that play is important for everybody. Uh, we all need a break. We all need to play. We all learn uh, through experimenting and trying new things and stuff like that. So A and B right now look good. I have to wait for the question, but right now A and B are my front runners. C, have students read a play in cooperative groups. All right, you might like this cooperative groups, but just to read a play, these are little kids. This isn't really developmentally appropriate. We're talking about pre-K through third, read the whole play in cooperative groups. I don't know if I would do that. D, have students listen to a play in their listening center. Okay, it's not bad, it's not great. A and B are better, okay? I'm gonna cross those off. Let's have a look at the question. Which of the following activities would support dramatic play in a classroom? Well, analyze is great, but we're looking for dramatic play. Dressing up is dramatic play, making B the correct answer. Don't talk yourself out of it, go with the obvious. All right, let's have a look at these here. We have hopping, writing, sewing, drawing. Can't do much, let's have a look. I see gross mortar. Which of the following activities would increase students' gross motor skills? Gross, those are the big movements of the big parts of the body, the torso, the arms, the legs. Writing, sewing, drawing are fine motor skills. Those are the little skills in the hands. That's the fine motor skills. Hopping is gross motor skills. Students get their gross motor skills first. They can move their body before they can pick up little things, right? Have you ever seen a baby like try to pick up a Cheerio? It's so funny because they're working on those gross gross motor skills, um, but this, or their fine motor skills, but this is asking for gross. This is the big stuff, hopping, skipping, jumping, running, writing, sewing, and drawing is fine motor skills. And the last one, nice scenario. Let's read the questions for, or the answer choices first. Model different scenarios of the game. Model, good word on this exam, especially for little kids. Any, anybody needs a good model. We all need to be modeling. So this is part of explicit instruction. We're modeling, I like it. B, give students a handout to accompany the rules presentation. All right, they're they're but they're pre-K three. A handout, I mean, maybe. I like A better. Modeling is better. C, ask the assistant principal for help. Nope, never the right answer. The assistant principal is busy. I assure you, I was an assistant principal. I didn't have time. Um, I was certainly there to help teachers, but you got to figure it out on your own in the classroom. That's part of it. So C is out. D, start the game with no rules because the students aren't ready yet. Nope, that's lowering the expectation. That's, that's another word for lowering the standard. We don't want that. A looks like it's my answer, although B is okay. Let's read the question. Mr. Rodriguez is a pre-K PE teacher. He is having a hard time getting students to understand the different rules of soccer. He has told them over and over, but they still do not seem to understand. Isn't that the thing we all say? I told you this a hundred times, right? What can Mr. Rodriguez do? Model. 
I talk about this a lot. Modeling expectations, modeling what you want students to do. If you have a set of expectations for your classroom, you should be demonstrating how to do that. Okay, boys and girls, this is how you walk into my classroom. You know, after you've gone through it, you say, everybody watch me. This is how I do it. Walk in the room, you put your backpack down. You pretend like you're the student, you model. If you have a new activity you want students to do, you show them, you model. Model is so effective. We use it in reading, writing, math, everything, uh, expectations, behavior, all of that. Model, model, model. A is the correct answer. Be on the lookout for the word model in answer choices because it 99.999% of the time is going to be the correct answer. Okay. All right. We have so many people on here today. 125. That's insane. All right. I'm so glad. Um, uh, you guys are here with me today. Um, let's see here. In my first test, I saw three more questions about body systems. Yeah, you'll get, it might be open circulatory, closed circulatory system, hot blood or hot blooded, warm blooded versus cold blooded. Um, you might have skeletal systems. I cover them in my book. Um, it is the basics, you know, but the basics are hard because I don't think about open circulatory systems and closed circulatory systems on a daily basis, right? So um, you do have to you do have to remember some of those things. So that's why it helps to refresh. Okay, um, I do not teach PE. There is a teacher for that. Does that make it unfair advantage to me? No. It. This is just. I mean, look, students. Are they going to use every single skill they're tested on? No. I can assure you. You will probably never use most of the algebra that you are required to do in order to graduate high school. I mean, that's the way it is, right? So it's it's just it's just the test. Try not to overanalyze. If your state is requiring it and you want to be a teacher, you got to do it. Um, I'm not saying it's fair. You know, it's very pricey. There are things I don't like about the testing industry, uh, but it's just the way it is. Okay. I wish I had all these questions. LOL. I would have gotten all right so far. All right, Emily. Good. I'm glad uh, you're feeling good about the test. Um, how long after graduation can one use their GPA to pass? That depends on your state. Some states don't use GPA um, to compensate for the test. Some do. Okay. All right. Um, this is so helpful. I'm going to purchase the book. Awesome. Is there a webinar for Praxis reading, math, and writing? Um, I'm not sure if you're, Darlene, if you're talking about the Praxis core, I have that already and I'm doing another one in a couple of weeks. So um, I just did the promo videos for that. It's actually in May, but I already have a pre-recorded. Let me show you where to get more um, webinars. Let me show you that guys. So we have more free resources. So on my website, go to free webinars here, click that. And some of you were asking, now these are the upcoming webinars. I got, this one is today, early childhood. I've got teaching reading. Somebody was asking about the 5901. If you're taking the 5901, you also have to take the 5205. So you may want to attend this on April 13th. I'm doing special education um, the following week on the 20th. And then I've got PLT, Praxis Core, 5001, and I believe ESOL coming up after these three um, into June 1st. So um, be on the lookout for those. We'll put those up here. But if you need them now and you can't wait, here's a Praxis Core webinar, same thing. Here's the replay, click it, use the form to sign up. You'll get the free study guide and um, uh, the replay link. You can watch them on demand right here. I've got PLT. I do all of these all the time. I've got 5001. The one person was looking for the 5901. You can use this. Just skip the, there's an ELA section in here, but it'll help you anyways with your teaching reading test. I also have a couple other things here. Um, this might help you how to lesson plan. I do these webinars at the beginning of the year. I'm going to do them again over the summer. Um, this one is how to, this one's for classroom management. This one's really good. A lot of people liked this one. I go through how to establish a classroom management plan that works. Um, teaching reading, I've got my um, ELA, this is secondary uh, education. So if you're taking the 5038, 39 or 5047, this is middle school, English language arts and high school. And then I have 7811 and 5006 here. So if you need more, go to my webinars page. There's more free stuff, more free study guides there, and that'll help you. Now also, I have a YouTube channel that is really helpful. And there are so many, um, 
playlists here. So of course I have latest videos. I publish, excuse me, I publish here every week, sometimes multiple times a week. I publish shorts too, but here's how to write an essay. Um, these are my live subject area sessions. Um, Praxis core. This is all just Praxis core PLT, all PLT. I've got a huge math, um, section. I have shorts here. They always take the worst thumbnails. Like look at this face here. I don't know why they do that. I wish they would like take a nice thumbnail and you can't change the thumbnails either on the big videos. You can on the long videos you can, but on the shorts, you can't. So I have these weird, Weird thumbnails. Anyways, uh, teaching reading, this is very helpful for literacy. Go to this teaching reading playlist and we'll link all this up into um, our email that I'm going to give you after this. But you can see here how to calculate your Praxis score. I have that. So this one is the test strategy playlist. This is very helpful. Um, and so we'll link that up, but go to my um, YouTube channel, subscribe. We've got about 60,000 subscribers and people find it really helpful. I do all kinds of things. You can, I have a writing an essay. If you're working on your um, graduate school, stuff like that. I got, if you want to become an assistant principal, I have SLLA. I've got all kinds of stuff on here. So go check that out. Then of course I am on TikTok. This is so fun. I love the shorts, um, doing all kinds of stuff here. I've got, you know, here I've got earth space science. Do you want to become an adjunct professor? I do. I just did a math video. This math video kind of went viral, 141,000 views, which is crazy. I worked so hard on these other ones. And then this random one goes viral, but anyways, it's really fun. I love TikTok. Check me out there. And and then of course, Facebook, um, we've got all of our stuff on Facebook here. I'm live there right now. All right. So really quickly, one more thing to get all of our resources. Oh, I didn't share my TikTok. This is my TikTok. Sorry. Um, I didn't click share this tab instead. Sorry about that. And then Facebook share that tab instead. Here I am right here. Okay. All right. So, um, let me go back to my website. So here's our website. If you want the early childhood products, you can go here, use the offer code. You can see in the chat. We'll also send you an email. If you're watching me on social media, click the link in the description, sign up and you will get the offer code right away. And you can buy, um, the, the stuff at a discounted price. And I believe that is it. You guys, do we have any other questions? Let me check. I need to take the 5002 and the 5021. Do you have any? Um, I don't believe there is a 5002. Five or 5022. There is no 5022. Oh, yes, there is early uh, content knowledge. I don't have that. Let me check the specs on that. Um, I'll have to check the specs on that. It looks like content knowledge. So it looks like, let me see, study companion, please hold study companion. <sighs> 5022. Yeah. Zero results found. Um, I don't think that's the test. If it is, it's not coming up. All right. Um, I'm so glad you found this helpful. Thank you so much for being here. We've had a lot of people here and you all stick around till the end. I really appreciated it. Uh, what's included in the course for the 5025. So you get the digital study guide and all the practice tests. There are videos and visual elements. It's just like an augmented uh, course. There are probably, I don't know exactly how many hours, but many hours of video of me going through the literacy portion, the math portion, social study science, and, and, um, uh, P, uh, P E and creative arts. Okay. So there's video. If you like videos, that's the one to do. All right, guys. So thank you so much for watching today. You will get the discount code, um, in the email, be on the lookout for that. I am so glad that you were here with me today. Try to enjoy your Saturday. You already studied enough and let me know how things are going. And I will see you next weekend for what am I doing next weekend? teaching reading, right? Teaching reading, teaching reading 5205. That's a good one too. If you are struggling with the literacy section or struggling with any like, um, English language arts, elementary ed, the 5205 is just really packed full of information there. So don't forget the offer code and 